Welcome back. All right, so I want to talk about the salary cap again today, this time from a different perspective, and, and look at long-term contracts that we're seeing getting signed right now, and why. So why would GMs want to sign long-term contracts? Uh, this is really a matter of economics, looking at the picture and saying, we think that this is something that's going to be um, a, a good deal for us long-term. So 2004-2005 is a year that didn't exist for the NHL as an on-ice entity. But off the ice, there was plenty going on. And eventually the NHLPA buckles with the idea of the salary cap becoming a thing and, and the hard cap becoming a thing. They they wanted to do similar, similar uh, ideas as to what we see in baseball. Uh, there was discussions of how they, they were willing to take a payroll back as long as there wasn't a salary cap. So I, I thought the union did its best publicly to look like they were doing whatever they could to to appease the owners and, and went over the fans. And for the most part, they did. But there was still that, well, the players are greedy thing that was out there because people will say it's players or the owners. And in reality, it's it's a business and, and it's a business that does quite well. So eventually the NHLPA loses the battle. They do win the war, I think. Uh, $39 million is what the salary cap set up for that first year. 2005-2006 uh, was a very good season. So the NHL made some money and the salary cap goes up. 2006-2007, the salary cap was $44 million. It went up by 12.82%. And fans, including myself, were saying, wait, we lost a whole year of hockey and we're already seeing the salary cap go up to right around where the money was before they had the lockout. It felt like we were seeing the salaries go right back to where they were before the lockout. And 2007-2008 didn't change that. That narrative was really strong. We were up to $50.3 million. It went up 14.32%. So in two years, the salary cap goes up 27%. And again, for fans like myself, it was, why did we lose a year of hockey for this? Salaries are now higher than they were before the the lockout and we were told owners could not afford this and here we are uh 2008 2009 another huge jump the last huge jump it's really taken uh 56.7 million dollars which is an increase of 12.72 percent so the money's really good things are going really really well and then 2009 2010 we only see uh the salary cap go up by a hundred thousand dollars to 56.8 million a difference of 0.18%. So that's a flat cap right there. And we're getting into discussions of concerns about the cap and concerns about how much money the players are making. So 2010, 2011, the salary cap goes up again to 59.4 million, but that's an improvement of 4.58%. Again, improvement if you're a player and if you're an owner, because it means you're making more money as well. So we've seen a salary cap go in five years from 39 million to 59.4 million dollars. It's a good thing they wiped out an entire year of hockey to make this happen. 2011, 2012, we pass into the 60 million dollar range at 64.3 million dollars, an increase of 8.25%. So the owners are complaining at this point now that the split is 60-40. Uh, the player's getting 60%, the owner's getting 50%. We've got to get this under control. So we have another lockout. Coming out of that lockout, the split is now 50-50 because, again, when it's billionaires versus millionaires, the billionaires will usually win that war. And 2012-2013, we see the salary cap drop 6.69% to $60 million even. So here we go, and you've got compliance buyouts and all this, and all right, we're going to see what's going to happen now. Uh, so the following season, 2013-2014, it, it goes back to 64.3 million, an improvement, an increase, an escalation of 7.17%. It's also, I, I would also say an improvement because it shows the league's pretty healthy. So again, you know, we had a lockout, we had a shortened season, and we see the salary cap going right back where it was before. 2014-2015, uh, the salary cap goes up to 69 million. Uh, it, it improved, again, increased, escalated 7.31%. And I look at that number and I think it's probably a good thing I didn't have a channel back then because I would have had so much giggling and tearing. Salary cap's at 69 million. This team's over 69. And yeah, it just, it would not have gone well. 2015, 2016, we see the slowdown, right? There's that slowdown that takes place here. 71.4 million 
which is an increase of 3.48%. And then 2016-2017, it's slower again, $73 million, an increase of 2.24%. And any time that you see those slowdowns, you're going to see more buyouts, you're going to see more contracts that um, guys are going to end up on the LTIR. I'm not going to say easier, but it feels like we see that more often. Uh, I know part of that is, of course, penalties for guys that retire and teams and cap hits and 35 plus contracts and all that. That's for a whole other time. But you could see that like GMs were having a hard time. They, they like it when they're spending more money. They like giving the guys whatever money they want. Uh, in 2017, 2018, the salary cap goes up to 75 million, an increase of 2.74%. 2018, 2019, the salary cap goes up quite a bit, 79.5 million, which was an increase of 6%. So with that extra money, of course, it's easier to, to, to get your team out there and, and keep it together. And every increase means that a bad contract looks a little bit less egregious than it did before. So 2019, 2020, and this of course is the, the big year, right? 81 and a half million is your salary cap, an increase of 2.52%. But the expectation in 2020 was that the salary cap would go up to around 84 million for the following year. So then we have the shutdown, right? Uh, and, and we have the pause and you have, you have everything going on and you finally get your playoffs in, but because of issues with money, you decide to freeze the cap. The salary cap stays at the same level for 2020, 2021, and 2021, 2022. No increase. Well, the players are still needing to be re-signed, and they still want, you know, good chunk of that money. And with escrow being as high as it was, uh, even with the contract signed, they weren't making the amount of money that it looked like they were. Now, this past season, uh, we saw that, you know, things were going to probably get better. And the salary cap for next year goes up $1 million. So a, a an increase of 1.23%. So it is a far, far slower increase than we were seeing at any point before other than 2009-2010, where it's a 0.18% increase. And then the expectation is 2023-2024, as well as 2024-2025, we will see the salary cap go up by a million dollars, which would be an increase of 1.21% and then 1.2% the following year. So the increases are very, very slow, right? It is very slow. But after 2025, all bets are off. Once we get into 2025, 2026, the idea is that the salary cap would go up. Now, keep in mind that from 2005, 2006 till 2014, 2015, the salary cap went up $30 million dollars over that 10 year period, right? Uh, from 2005 till 2015, it goes from 39 million to $69 million. Huge increase. Uh, and so 2024, 2025, once the debt that the players are, are paying back from the money owed for those two seasons of flat cap, it, once that's paid back, we could see a salary cap of easily above $90 million. Uh, I would think because you look at the amount of money that's being uh, earned right now, the NHL earned a record revenue of $5.3 billion. And that's a conservative estimate. It may be higher than that once they take all of their uh, expenses and and, uh, and income. Once they take all that into account, it could be higher than $5.3 billion. Uh, sponsorship money this past year went from $623 million to $1.4 billion. They got the ESPN deal, which was huge, right? And so we're seeing streaming numbers going up. Uh, I also, I didn't put it on the board, but they, they decided to get into NFTs starting this season. I think they're getting in a little late on the NFT craze, but uh, you know, I mean, they made pogs. So sure, why not have NFTs? Um, you can, for every 10 NFTs you buy, you get a free pack of pogs. There you go. It's just, there you go. Or every 10 pack of pogs, you get a free NFT. Why not? Uh, so the escrow number is going to drop as well, which is how this was all designed. It was 17.2% this past year, meaning 17.2% of their money goes into escrow. They don't see it. They'll get, I would think the money that went into escrow from this past year, they will get some of that back. I don't know how much, but the escrow drops to 10% this year. So that's a huge difference for players. 
and then it's supposed to drop to 6% for following seasons and probably go away just in time for the next collective bargaining agreement. Uh, and by go away, I mean drop to a, a much less significant number. Although I think the union will push for escrow to be done away with. I, I think the union would really like to see that gone. We know that there are certain members of NHL teams that would really like to see it gone. It's Panarin that really uh, didn't like it the last time around, right? So uh, we will see what happens with it. But for the three seasons following this one, it's supposed to be 6%. Now, of course, we're starting to see jersey ads this year too. And everybody's going to be all excited about that, right? Uh, not supposed to be on retail jerseys yet the promise was it wouldn't be seen on retail jerseys but it's more money right it's more more advertising revenue it's like the helmet ads and what we saw with 2020 with the pause and with the amount of money lost by the nhl is that the nhl has found new avenues now for sponsorship for advertising but i think we were going down this road anyways i think 2020 sped it up i think 2020 meant that plans they were looking at like well we'll do that in five years well we'll do that later I think it sped those plans up where it's like, okay, we need the money now. So we're going to go ahead and put the ads on jerseys. We're going to take all of the flack from uh, the fans and from traditionalists, but we're going to do it. Um, and the first board ads in the NHL appeared in 1980. Just, just for an example, before 1980, there were no ads on the boards. There weren't any on the ice until the 1990s. So we have seen an increase in advertising. And the plan is, in all 32 arenas this year, at least they're hoping to have digital ads on all the boards. So the plan seems to be one of continually replacing the ads. Uh, I know one thing that I always uh, found kind of entertaining. Well, I found it entertaining the first couple times I went to see games was in between periods when they would go around and change certain ads on the boards. And I, I just thought that was interesting because watching on TV, I, it never occurred to me that the board ads would change during the game. So I, I, I thought that was kind of interesting to watch that first couple of times. But the plan is to make it all digital. And obviously, for a simple reason, you look at the projected ads, whether it's onto the glass, and they look awful. The ones on the ice, which also usually look pretty awful, especially when the puck's coming in across the blue line. And, and so the puck's moving, and so is the ad on the ice. Really, it's, it's just because then it draws your eye to the ad, like, what's going on over there? But... The plan is to have digital board ads so that they can rotate more money. It's all about making more money. And the more money that the NHL makes, the more that this number goes up. So what we've seen is we've seen an increase in revenues from all over. Ticket sales are still pretty brisk in the NHL. Ticket prices have not come down while all of the ad revenues have gone up, while sponsorships have gone up, while all the gambling stuff has gone through the absolute roof, right? And I've talked about that before. And, and how problematic I think it is long term. But right now, I don't think they're necessarily concerned about that. Uh, but yeah, it is. We are definitely into an age right now where the money is, you know, ridiculous over the top. I wouldn't be surprised if the NHL comes out after this year and goes, yeah, so we made $5.6 billion. I think, and I think that's conservative. It could end up being higher than that. But because of the fact that the, the players have to pay back the billion dollar plus uh, debt that they had owed to the to the owners because of the 2020 uh, bubble playoffs and and how that just decimated NHL revenues and the shortened 2020 2021 season which also didn't have the gate receipts that uh, owners like so much and and it definitely hurt their money. Uh, once that money's paid back, we will see that explosive growth. So, bringing me to the reason for this video is that if you sign a seven or eight year deal with a player right now doesn't matter how old he is. You can be 32, you can be 33. Once you get into years four through seven or four through eight, that contract should be much better because year one would be 2022, 2023, right? Uh, and then year two would be 2023, 2024. Year three would be 2024, 2025. Year four, you have a salary cap that should explode, should go up to around the 91 million mark. So those contracts should look better. They're not gonna look great. They're not going to look great, but they should look better. And for a team like Arizona, right? Now your salary cap goes up seven, eight million dollars. So does the floor. The cap floor goes up. And for teams that aren't making a ton of money, uh, and Arizona is the easy target, but there are other teams as well that are making a ton of money, bringing in a contract of a veteran player who can still play uh, and getting a first round draft pick with that player who can still play uh, to put them on your roster, 
it could be a good way to go about business, right? And so while these players might have no movement clauses, no trade clauses, they're really in place there because they want to make sure they have control over where they go if they go anywhere. And so I don't look at a no movement clause and think, well, he's not getting traded because we've seen plenty of times where a guy will waive that clause. But this, this I think, is the thinking with the long-term contracts. They're looking at the big picture and they're saying the league right now is making a ton of money. The artificially high cap is now being held down because of how it was artificially high before. And then once we get to years four through seven, those deals should look much better. For young players who are signing the long-term contracts, these deals could look absolutely ridiculously cheap for teams. Uh, think along the lines of the Nathan McKinnon deal in Colorado, which has aged very, very well. As expensive as it looked at the time he signed it, because he hadn't lived up to his advanced billing at the time he signed that contract. But it was a very smart signing by Sackick to give him his money and, and show faith in him, and he's rewarded that. So when young players are signing a seven or eight year deal, and I'm, I'm looking at you, Jason Robertson, please sign a contract. But yeah, once we get to years four through eight, those contracts could look fantastic. We talk a lot about $10 million plus players and, and how hard it is to win with a $10 million plus cap hit on your team. Uh, we're going to have that conversation for probably the next few years and then it could go by the wayside because once that salary cap goes through the roof, so does the asking price of the players, right? So you're going to have a lot of guys saying, look, the salary cap's $94 million. I want $10 million. That's That's reasonable because look at where the cap hit is or where the salary cap is, the, the ceiling. So I, I really think we're going to see a huge jump. Uh, the speculation's been into the $90 million range, and I, I think it could go higher because the $5.3 billion the league just made, there's no reason to think that number's going to drop next year. There's no reason to think it's not going to go up, especially, you know, they've added the jersey ads. And as I, I agree, you know, I saw the one ad today, um, the Capitals revealed their ad, and, and it just... It, it is kind of like this this sad moment. And the player wearing said jersey didn't look overly happy either, at least in the picture they took. Because I'm sure it's like, great, why do I, you know, they're taking my picture with the jersey. Oh. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's just, it's going to happen. You know, it's going to be in all the sports. And while there's a lot of people who will say they're, they're going to stop watching because of all the advertising, and I get it, um, I, I haven't seen any effect on on the numbers on the channel necessarily which doesn't mean a whole lot but the nhl's numbers were really high now if the nhl's numbers start to drop and if players are telling the NHL, or if players if fans are telling the nhl listen the advertising's reached that breaking point and we're done and if enough people said it then we would start to see the that that advertising drop off a bit because if if the NHL sees a drop in gate revenues or sees a huge drop in merchandise sales and that kind of thing, I think that would jolt them back to, okay, we won't put advertising on the jerseys. We'll cut the advertisements out. The ones on the helmets really haven't bothered me. They, they really haven't been, I don't think they've been too intrusive. The one ad on an NHL jersey isn't necessarily awful, but at the same time, it looks very out of place to me anyways. But we'll see what happens next, right? Uh, the digital ads, you'd have to think, would mean more advertising because then you can fit more advertisers on the boards. Uh, you can sell maybe two periods worth of advertising or a period worth of advertising rather than a whole game worth. But you can get more advertisers in that way and just push that price point up a little bit on each period worth of hockey and uh, you're making more money because... That's kind of the name of the game is just to, to keep making more money. So there you go. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below as always. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through you just happened upon this video. Thank you guys so much for watching for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.